Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome. I'm Margot Smith, director of Kluge Rue Aboriginal Art Collection. And I want to welcome you tonight to Monumental Meanings, Indigenous Perspectives on Monuments and Memorials in Charlottesville and Beyond. Now, could you please join me in taking a moment to acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land we're on today, the Monacan people, and their elders past and present. And I also wish to honor the enslaved African and African American people who labored to build our country and the University of Virginia and to recognize their descendants. So Kluge Roo is really excited tonight to offer this program with the Mellon Indigenous Arts Program, um, which is a joint uh, activity of the Fralin Museum and the College of Arts and Sciences and the Office of Diversity Programs, also with American Studies and with the Virginia Indian Programs at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. So I thank everybody who's participating tonight. But the inspiration for this program really came out of Karen Wood's letter to the editor at the Daily Progress on August 15th. And Karen raised a number of issues in that letter um, she was responding in one point to Jason Kessler's statement, quote, nothing against any other group of people, against Muslims, against blacks, whomever, but they have entire continents in which they can inhabit, where their culture and their bloodlines are secure. In the United States, we are being replaced, end quote. And as Karen says, quote, unless all of Kessler's ancestors are American Indian, they came from another continent. American Indians were brutally replaced by European Americans. Our histories were erased. We have nowhere else to call home, end quote. And her second point, Karen said, quote, American Indians don't exist in the minds of most Charlottesville residents, perhaps because we are hardly here, and there are historical reasons for that, end quote. And then the third point that she brings up is that, quote, no one is talking talking at the moment about the two representations that depict Native people in public spaces. The offensive Lewis and Clark statue in which Sacagawea cowers when she was in fact providing directions, and George Rogers Clark threatening Native people with guns and powder keg as he conquers the Northwest." End quote. So we really heard Karen, and coincidentally, at Kluge Roo, we have an artist in residence, Julie Goff, whose work, from an indigenous Australian perspective, speaks to very similar issues. In planning this panel, we wish to bring these perspectives together, to turn our attention to our local statues depicting indigenous people, and to monuments and memorials in Virginia and beyond, including the dearth of markers that call attention to the true history of indigenous people worldwide. And so, with that, I want to introduce our moderator for tonight, Casey Keeler. Casey is a postdoctoral fellow in American Studies at the University of Virginia. She received her PhD in American Studies at the University of Minnesota in May 2016 and earned her BA at the University of Wisconsin in Political Science in 2005. Casey is an interdisciplinary scholar drawing on demography, historical archives, legal and policy documents, oral history, and autoethnography. Her research is largely informed by placemaking, public memory, and public history. In particular, her work demonstrates the continuous residency of American Indian people in suburbs, disrupting natives of suburbs as primarily white places that, that developed from the post-World War II housing boom. While at UVA, Casey is transforming her dissertation into a book man manuscript um, titled, at least uh, for now, as uh, American Indians and the American Dream, Suburban Indians, Policies, and Property in Minnesota. Please help me welcome Casey Keeler. So thank you, Margot, for the lovely introduction. Um, thank you all so much for joining us here tonight and contributing to this ongoing conversation we've been having at UVA and across Charlottesville in the state and at the national level and international as we have Julie here to join us tonight. Um, I look very much forward to hearing everybody's um, words on the meaning of monuments here in the city um, and taking your questions as well at the end. So tonight we're gonna begin with Karen Wood. Karen is a member of the Monacan Indian Nation and director of the Virginia Indian Program at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. She has worked at the National Museum of the American Indian as a researcher 
and at the associate and at the Association of the American Indian Affairs as a repatriation specialist. So please welcome Karen. Thank you all for coming out. Obviously, this is a topic that is of current relevance to so many of us. And um, I guess I would start by welcoming you to our homeland. Um, we are Monacan people who have been in place for thousands of years. We don't even know how many thousands we've been here. But we say it's so long, it doesn't matter. You know, it's time immemorial. And when I give my presentations, I talk about how our legends and myths reflect stories of giant bears and giant beaver and giant bison. And we have found archeological evidence of those creatures here in Virginia. So we don't know how long human beings have been here interacting with the land. But what I want to say about uh, monuments is that native people began to build monuments on the land in order to mark places of significance. And we began by gathering up collections of stones. And people said, the stones are markers of uh, the number of people who established each community. So way back when, we were already understanding that there are ways to, to put markings on Earth, uh, which is the title of my first book, by the way, um, of poetry. And I think that's important because Native people have always said, we are the land. You know, there is such a relationship that's so integral between us and land. It's not landscape as a two-dimensional view, like a painting. It's a multi-dimensional world. Um, this is actually a title slide from a presentation we did a few weeks ago, at which Jeff uh, was present, where we talked about how people commemorate the dead, how American Indians have commemorated the dead in this area, and how descendants of enslaved people commemorated their dead. And Monacans have been known culturally as people who mark the landscape by burying the dead in mounds. So these are, uh, this is a map of Monacan mounds. The purple circles are the mound sites, and the red triangles are uh, community sites, as identified by John Smith. Not, only, uh, not always because he actually visited those places, but because Native people reported to him that their communities were in these places. So what this map tells me is that we had been building our mounds throughout the mountain and Piedmont region, and we're in a process of moving eastward. One of those mounds at Manasuka Panal, which is identified both as a mound site and a Native community, it is right here in Charlottesville. And so uh, we were already here. This mound was observed by Thomas Jefferson, who uh, wrote about it in Notes on the State of Virginia. He said that he excavated this mound. I doubt he did that alone. And that he removed uh, disarticulated um, human remains. So what we were doing was bringing together the bones of our ancestors in community at specific ceremonial times and reburying them in a, a very sacred way. And those mounds became markers on the land to identify where we lived and who we were. And that's how archaeologists even now uh, tell us about ourselves. So this is a mound site that I pulled off of the web because the mound sites in Virginia no longer exist. Most of them have been plowed down. We know that there are at least 13 of them. And so this was our way of commemorating our ancestors and continuing to live with them in community. So they were part of us. They have always been part of us. And when I say our world is multidimensional, part of those dimensions includes a, a spiritual component, an understanding of lived beings as those that relate with us as people. So here's a mound site as we might find one today if there are any left. Um, and what I love about it is I feel like uh, the trees have come from the people. You know, um, we say uh, like the whole top inch of the land is us. And so if we are the land, it, it means it literally, atomically, 
not just in a, an ephemeral metaphorical sense, you know, but it's, it's really that deep, that kind of connection to place. So this is Bear Mountain, and some of us were here today. I want to honor our Dakota visitors who are with us. Um, we didn't get to go to Bear Mountain, but it's right next to our tribal headquarters. And Bear Mountain is the spiritual center of Monacan people, our community today. It's what's left of, of um, everything that, that was once the Piedmont of Virginia. And we were able to cohere in a community at this one spot. There's an ancestral cemetery there. This identifies Amherst County, uh, where our people are located. And it is the most sacred space that's left to us. Here is the log cabin schoolhouse where our people attended school um, until 1963. They weren't allowed to attend public schools in Virginia. So there was a one room log cabin that had uh, been built in 1870 that was um, taught by white school teachers provided by Amherst County, uh, established by an Episcopal mission and the only place where our people were permitted to identify as American Indian. Because during the 20th century, Virginia decided there were two races of people. There were white people and there was everybody else. And we were in the everybody else category, otherwise known as colored. And Virginia enacted policies uh, that caused officials to change our racial designations on our birth certificates. And there was no high school for uh, American Indians in Virginia. If you wanted to go to high school, you had to go to a federal boarding school in a place like Muskogee, Oklahoma. Um, at the same time, there was a federal boarding school here at Hampton where folks from the Dakotas and other tribes were brought as a way to assimilate them into non-native culture, to distance them from their own tribal communities and those centers that I was talking about to forbid them to speak their languages and to make them into little white people so that they could supposedly survive uh, the genocide that was happening to them. This is the uh, schoolhouse as it looked in 1914 when it was photographed by Jefferson Davis. And so these are the kinds of monuments to American Indian survival that we would have seen at that time. We weren't putting up statues to American Indians. What I learned in school, as many of you probably did, is that history is a list of important dates and facts, things that, were, uh, that happened over time and that um, are worth commemorating. And so often we found that history is commemorated by monuments to individuals. Um, when we talk to Native people, they say, we don't want to put up statues to one person. We want the statue to the whole community. And so when we develop a tribute to American Indians at the Richmond State Capitol, which is being built right now as we speak, it's not about one person. It's not a statue of Pocahontas as it would have been 50 years ago. It's a, an understanding of that entire cycle of 18,000 years to today, because we are still people of today. We are not obstacles to American civilization. We are not people in the past tense. You know, we want to, um, to, to bring all of that cyclical understanding together and to say every bit of our past is important. So next one, um, that's the end. And uh, yeah, so, so what I guess I really want to leave you with is the idea that we can change the story we tell about the past. I think that how we memorialize that history says more about us than it does about those people who lived back then. You know, if we're still saying, for example, that Robert E. Lee was a great and noble man and not considering some of the complexities of the history in context, then we're missing out on elements of that story. In the same way, if we contextualize Native people as people of the past, we are missing out not only on all of the, the deep history uh, before American um, settlers arrived, but also the contemporary presence and continuing contributions of that native knowledge, which is so much more about sustaining our world than extracting resources from it. So whatever we decide 
about the statues that still exist. And I have already apologized to our visitors for that horrific display with George Rogers Clark, um, which is embarrassing. You know, I mean, if that's all we have to say about Native history in Charlottesville, we need to add to the story, um, not just take away. So that's really all I want to say. Thanks. Our next speaker this evening is Jeffrey Hantman. He is a professor of anthropology here at the University of Virginia, and he has partnered with Karen Wood to rewrite state signage referencing Native Americans in Virginia, including the state highway markers, one of which I drive past daily as I come down 29 to UVA. His recent research engages in the practices of indigenous and collaborative archaeology, framing new questions of the archaeological record that are rooted in Native concepts of power, landscape, history, and hierarchy. He has a new book due out this spring from the University of Virginia Press titled Monacan Millennium. Please welcome Professor Hantman. Thanks, Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the invitation from uh, Kluge Roo and all of you to participate in this panel. I'm honored. Uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is actually work that Karen and I have done together in the past. And um, it concerns the issue of uh, not statues, but the path, what I call and others call the path to sanctification. I think the statues that have been so contested and deserve to be contested have reached the stage of being sanctified. Uh, landscape architect and historian Kenneth Foote very briefly has talked about that path as being one of three paths that nations, that states can take. One uh, that Kenneth Foote has talked about, one of three paths that nations and states take when dealing with places of violence and the legacy of violence and injustice. He takes a very complex topic, and I'm going to follow him because I only have nine minutes at this point. And he says, states do basically one of three things. They obliterate, they register or document, and they sanctify. And what I've seen in Virginia is that sites that I know to be places of violence and injustice are most often obliterated. As Karen mentions, the displacement of the Monacan Indian people from the home of their ancestors, and then the destruction of those mounds and the burials within them by unchecked natural forces such as flooding, but especially the intentional pushing down by uh, farmers and the destruction by, by people who claim to be archaeologists. Uh, and were not, uh, or did not have the ethics of contemporary archaeology. There's a kind of obliteration. There's obliteration when we create, maybe with the best of intentions, living history museums that show houses, and nobody's living in them. And there's one man who may or may not be an indigenous man off in the corner making arrowheads. And he's not talking about world politics the way the reconstructed James Ford has all kinds of people walking around talking about the Spanish and the Dutch. That's a living place. You visit the adjacent village, and it's, I consider that obliterated. Many more examples, of course, could be given. But the history of violence and injustice has largely been obliterated. There is a path, I think. And you may think it's simple, but I've seen it work. That in working with Karen, working with the former state agency known as the Virginia Council on Indians, Deanna Beecham, who was the director of that, we started uh, a path to sanctification, which begins with recognition, which begins with documentation. I'm actually talking about the program of Virginia's historical highway markers. Casey, you're the only person that has ever mentioned the sign on Route 29, Karen and I wrote it. I'm going to be talking about it tonight. It says Monacan Indian Village. What a coincidence that you're the only person who's ever noticed that sign. You're doing 60 miles an hour at that point, coming over the <laughs> And how many people have stopped to read this one about Edgar Allan Poe? I used to be on the state board that looked at the grammar, looked at the text. 
I hope you know these things are paid for by individuals, by organizations. It's about $1,200. Maybe the price has gone up. The text has to be vetted by the state board. I used to be on that board. I didn't think it was the most important thing we do. But these books come out, and people read them, and there's history. But is there a history of the violence? Is there a history of the injustice? Is there a history that has been obliterated that might be rectified with a first step towards the state sanctioning through the approval of the language of these highway signs. That's a first step, and it leads to more. And I'm happy to discuss those examples with you. In the early, in, in about 2002, the Virginia Council, this, with much credit, I have to say, to two state agencies, the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, which oversees the highway program, and the Virginia Council on Indians together recognized the signage, the, the highway markers that are about Native Americans are atrocious and are about massacres and about people, you know, the, the, the destruction of Native culture. And, and they really were an odd lot, never written by indigenous people. And so they really contributed to the obliteration, I would say. In 2002 and continuing, the state appropriated money for uh, 20 new signs, most of which went, uh, many of which, or at least half of which, I should say, I don't remember how it all played out, but half of which went to uh, highway markers on Native American history in Virginia, and half uh, were for signs about African American history in Virginia. In other words, histories that of violence, the legacy of violence that had been obliterated. Um, I was honored to participate in the writing of some of these signs with Karen and with Deanna. I will say quickly, th this is a lot of small print, but one of the first things that happened through the Virginia Council on Indians is that people who ordinarily would not be recognized by and sanctioned, you know, acknowledged by the, by the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, as as a rich part of a Virginia history, includes not Chief Powhatan, Father of Pocahontas, although he gets plenty of recognition, but Powhatan's younger brother, Opie Cancanu. Opie Cancanu, who led two armed rebellions against the English uh, when they were at Jamestown. The first one quite successful, the last one not so. And in the small print, and I didn't want to dwell, there's one sign I'm going to dwell on in my short time, but this sign tells you about Opie Cancanu's leading of the resistance, which, by the way, happened in the Pueblo region. It happened in Hawaii. It happened, the, the response to colonialism was fierce, and it was violent, and it needed to be written from an indigenous point of view. This was written by Deanna. The last sentence notes that Opie Cancanu lived to be nearly 100 years old when he was captured after the conflict of 1644, the Second Rebellion, Imprisoned at Jamestown, he was killed when a prison guard shot him in the back. That's a Virginia State Highway marker. I hope you don't drive by that at 60 miles an hour. It's over on Route 60. And buy that book and see these new signs. This is a, a sign that simply says Paspahe Indians. The Paspahe were the Indians who were displaced by the Jamestown colonists. They were part of the Powhatan chiefdom. They paid tribute to Chief Powhatan, but Chief Powhatan urged them to move to other places. Uh, he allowed the, column, the Jamestown colonists to settle, but that didn't create good feelings between the Paspahe and the English. And this sign, it's almost too horrible to read, but this is now a state-sanctioned recognition of this event. In, uh, after 1610, George Percy, on orders from Governor de la Warre, just arrived destroyed the Paspahe town and its crops, killing 16 people, capturing the wife and children of the chief on their return to Delaware ship. The English, this is tough, the English threw the children overboard and then shot them in the head and later executed the chief's wife. That's a Virginia highway marker. It acknowledges the legacy of violence. Sure, most people are driving by it at 60 miles an hour. But if somebody's planning a new development in that area, if somebody's planning an adjustment of that highway, 
And somebody now at the state level is thinking about the area around what was Paspahe. This is now official state history in that language, as is happening right now down in Columbia, Virginia, on the, on the James River, where there's a highway marker acknowledging the presence of the Monacan's chiefest town called Rasswick, and that is uh, going to be an issue for people who plan to build a water pump there. My last uh, image is the sign that Casey mentioned. Do you all recognize it? You actually do? Amazing. Then you're holding up traffic. <laughs> it is there, and let's, I won't, here's all the text. I'm not gonna read it because I, I've, inspired by Karen, who is a brilliant poet. This is not poetry, but I turned it. I wanna show you how we took a text and that seems on the one hand descriptive, but on the other hand is a path towards uh, beyond designation and towards sanctification of the Monacan village of Montezuka Pinaw, which was, had the burial mound adjacent to it. The text reads two last slides and I'm done. In the black ink is what is written on the sign. The red ink is what Karen and I, what Karen actually was saying to me and we went with. So this is um, transgressive. This is a meant and it will eventually reach people who want to hear an alternative history. The sign reads near here. We're not gonna tell you exactly where it is because we don't trust that you won't go dig it up in your spare time as people have done for a century. On both sides of the Rivanna River, significance, what's this, that says to you, if you are not an indigenous person, that the indigenous landscape is one in which rivers are not boundaries, but were the heart of the village. It was located, this, this village was located, the, was a Monacan Indian village called Montezuka Pinaw. As opposed to all the signs up to 2000, it doesn't refer generically to Indians lived here, but a named people in a named town. And that information has always been there. These were not the people of the Piedmont or the people in the West. Monacans and Montezuka Pinaw, those are indigenous names. This village was one of five towns Karen was just talking about this. Captain Smith recorded it by name. Though many more existed, and we, we wrote those words, quoting Smith to say, that John Smith map that everybody sees in their fourth grade textbook and seventh grade textbook and 11th grade textbook and every museum you ever visit that only shows five Monacan towns, the document is a partial record of the ancestral Monacan world has many more towns that existed. Now we know not everyone reading the sign is getting these messages, but it's gonna sink in. Montezuka Pinal was a chief's village. It debunks common understandings of Monacan political structure. The last three lines it was occupied for several centuries. This is emphasizing to the reader the continuity of place, especially where the ancestors were. Until the late 17th or early 18th century, Late 17th, early 18th century, that means Monacan people are here long after the Jamestown colony is settled. In every, one, every textbook you've ever seen in Virginia, 1607 arrives, that's the end of the Indian story. And so we've told, in a sentence, that will sink in. Indian history continues, not only at Montezuka Pinaw, but Monacan descendants still reside throughout the central Virginia area. The tribe's headquarters today is on Bear Mountain in Amherst County, look, at, and if we could include a link to a website and the cast iron sign, and we're restricted to 100 words, we would have, but hopefully people go to the web and discover the Monacans in Virginia today, 21, number 2,100 people on their rolls, strong and vibrant. And so these signs may seem simple. You may walk past many of them. They are the step, the necessary step to recognition by the state which is the path to the sanctification and the larger story being told. The best example of that is the village of Werewakomiko, which was Powhatan's chief's village, started as a highway sign, is now 
in a collaborative venture with the Chickahominy people and other native people of Virginia, owned collaboratively with the National Park Service. And I predict in the year 2057, when the 450th anniversary of Jamestown is commemorated, it will take place not at Jamestown, but in an act of telling the narrative of resistance and perseverance at Werowocomico. Look it up on the map, because if you're here in 2057, that's where you want to go. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hantman. Our next speaker this evening is Ben Walters. Walters. He is a UVA student and vice president of the Native American Student Union here on grounds. After August 11th and 12th, NASU, the Native American Student Union, students held a purification ceremony at the Jefferson statue on the lawn just adjacent to where we are now. Um, ben will speak tonight from a student's perspective about the two statues in Charlottesville, um, just the, court, the Conquerors of the Northwest statue and then further down on Main Street, the Lewis and Clark statue that both feature indigenous people. So please welcome Ben. Hello everybody. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming out here. I'm glad to see all of you. And I'd like to thank my fellow panelists for coming out today and, uh, and having this event. And of course the organizers of the event as well. This is uh, a really great thing to be having here. Um, so public speaking isn't really my thing, so I just prepared a quick little statement here. But uh, I hope it does shed some light on uh, our perspective as Native students here. <coughs> The Native American Student Union is constantly works towards welcoming Native students in the university, greater recognition of indigenous culture, and recognition of indigenous contributions to society. Both statues involving nat Native peoples in Charlottesville work against our goals. While they do acknowledge the existence of Native people, they do nothing to honor those who they depict. The statue of Lewis and Clark on Main Street shows the two men standing tall and proud with Sacagawea crouching at their feet and peeking out from behind their coattails. The statue of George Clark on the corner reading Conqueror of the North depicts Clark high on a horse while several natives labor below him. These statues show uh, any native students here that their people are only worth recognizing as the servants of their supposed superiors. It also shows non-natives that we exist but uh, were largely insignificant in the history of the United States. These statues are not alone, however. Any Indian sculpt, uh, sculpted alongside a white person is in a low, subservient position. And when indigenous peoples get their own statues, they're often depicted all the same, a shirtless man in leggings and a breech cloth with feathers in his hair. And very few depict a specific person. The static representation and ambiguous identity of these figures adds to the prevailing impression that Native peoples are only an artifact of history instead of an integral part of our nation's founding and the traditions, found, founding and traditions, as well as a living part of our society today. What these statues also illuminate <coughs> is the sense of identity that many American Europe, uh, Americans of European descent have as the heroes of history, ignoring the terrible cost their, of their ancestors' success. Lacking a sense of connection with their mother countries and their histories, European Americans have attempted to manufacture a grandiose lineage of themselves in this country, starting from their arrival, and ignoring what was here before. Until the American identity changes to recognize the true progression of American history, these statues and the ideas behind them will remain the norm, and all we can do <coughs> is inform the people around us of America's whole history to bring about that change. Thank you, Ben. Our fourth speaker this evening is Julie Goff. She is an indigenous Tasmanian artist whose work is held in major public and private collections, including the National Gallery of Australia. Her work explores the lack of monuments and interpretation to indigenous Tasmanians who were massacred during invasion. Her art practice raises awareness about these histories and various forms of national amnesia in Australia. We are delighted to have her here in Charlottesville. Please give her a warm welcome. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, firstly, I'd like to pay my respects to the Monacan people and express my gratitude at being welcomed on to their lands. 
um, and next to pay my uh, respects to Klugiru um, and everyone there for hosting me during my residency, which is um, going pretty well. Yeah, um, so I'm going to um, give a bit of an overview of uh, my culture and um, what uh, negligible uh, amount of monumental activity there is in terms of uh, um, acknowledging our, our my indigenous peoples. I'll um, then move to mainland Australia and and uh, and also um, talk a little about um, memorial monuments there in terms of what's happening um, uh, as a direct consequence of what has been happening over here. In fact, um, and I'll see how I go with the ten minute slot. Um, so. Um, I'll, I'll start there. So yeah, I'm from uh, Tasmania, which um, next, if you know Australia, just here is my island home. Uh, my family is uh, traditionally from northeast Tasmania, Tebrakuna in our language. And uh, today the population is 500,000 people, 500,000 people. It's about four hours to drive east to west or north to south. Now, our island's been isolated for more than 8,000 years since the last ice age. Uh, we were, um, at the time that the British arrived and colonised in 1803, 5,000 people. Uh, our island, we refer to it as Chowana, uh, but the British arrived, it was known already as Van Diemen's Land and was established as a penal colony for the British. Um, within 50 years, our 5,000 or so uh, ancestors were reduced in number to less than 50 people. Uh, it was a concerted effort. It was um, not uh, written in legislation to attempt genocide of our ancestors and us, but uh, it was, there was basically a blind eye, uh, an acceptance to hand out firearms to convict, uh, convicts and and, uh, and the land was uh, wanted for pasture, so our people were in the way. Um, so basically until the 19, late 70s, the <coughs> education texts such as these uh, basically blamed our ancestors for becoming extinct. We were basically um, doomed, uh, sort of a Darwinist kind of approach. Uh, and so, the population, the Aboriginal community today uh, is, is strong, but more than half would be fairly quiet about their ancestry as a result of um, continual um, racism. It, it's um, taken a very strong organisation and several others have grown up since uh, in Tasmania to, to um, en engender enough um, kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, courage, pride and determination to change our, our uh, status in order to affect the changes we need, which basically are about re returning our ancestors home from museums and collections around the world as human remains, as they were so collected, <coughs> and for our land to be returned to us, which has been happening since the mid-1990s. Um, but this is the kind of text that uh, still can be found in in uh, secondhand shops in Tasmania. Um, yeah, so there are a couple, only a couple of memorial, so-called memorials uh, erected not by us, um, but purport to be about our people. Um, and this is just one example of a change that occurred. So they're not um, statues in their just plaques, uh, but this is the kind of uh, eulogiac language that is in a lot of texts since the 1870s when our last uh, tribal uh, people were still alive, in, in people that had lived um, before colonisation in a traditional sense uh, on, on our own lands. So this, uh, this text was, um, was not supported by Aboriginal community and so uh, kind of mysteriously it disappeared in two, around 2002 and the next slide shows just uh, with parks and wildlife, we effected a minimal change, which was the plaque basically uh, just commemorates the portrait there above it of Chuganini, who has been the poster child for um, 
for mainstream Tasmania, an, an Aboriginal woman who uh, had a fairly um, horrendous life, in fact, but so much is known about her life that she became the person that um, is often referred to as representing all Tasmanian Aboriginal people. Uh, so this, um, we, we've, we're finding it very difficult to move the mainstream population away from just referring to Tuganini all the time. Uh, but she did live at, um, on Bruni Island and this is the uh, location for where this uh, memorial and marker is. So uh, that has remained there. Uh, next slide is the other memorial in Tasmania that exists, which is a plaque in the in the middle of a crossroad. It's kind of a traffic hazard in a in a in a in a, in a uh, small town called Mathina, and Mathina is the name of a of an Aboriginal child who only grew to her mid-teens. She was treated uh, tremendously badly by being taken from her extended family after her parents had died, incarcerated on Flinders Island, where most Tasmanian Aboriginal people's ancestors were uh, sent in a sweep by the government to exile all people from mainland Tasmania in 1830. So Methina there is a portrait of her in watercolour there around 1842. This town is named after her, but af well after the, the fact. And the plaque suggests that she was befriended by the governor uh, and taken in by the governor and his wife educated and then on their return to England after their term in office she returned to her tribe when in fact they dumped her in the orphan asylum. Um, she um, took to alcohol and um, drowned. She, so, so this is the kind of you know um, the kind of history that we, we uh, kind of live, live with and we I suppose we need to find ways to to um, challenge it more effectively but we've been working with other uh, important duties first and responsibilities I've mentioned with ancestors return and land return. But there's constant reminders of these um, alternative histories around us such as that. Um, I'm not sure how many minutes. So then I'll speak about mainland Australia for a bit now. This is um, the date, 25th of August. Uh, these are from the internet. Uh, so. In Sydney, where there are numerous statues of, of uh, colonists, uh, particularly those that were purported to have discovered Australia uh, and governors in charge of the colony. So we have on the left uh, Captain Cook, who was said to have discovered Australia in 1770, uh, termed then terra nullius, so unoccupied in the sense that uh, Britain recognised people that uh, harvested and division the, you know, the land into parcels that were um, expected in, in, the, in the Europe, for example. So Aboriginal people were not recognised as, as um, properly occupying Australia, hence the place could be um, colonised. So the t text that was sprayed on uh, at this date changed the date, uh, no pride in genocide, changed the date which really refers to something that's very contentious all over Australia is the 26th of January is the date that's a public holiday celebrating Australia Day. Aboriginal people refer to that uh, date as Invasion Day because it's the date that the first fleet arrived with colonists and convicts to, into uh, uh, Botany Bay and uh, to start colonising New South Wales. And then Tasmania is 1803, Victoria is 1836. So it's a southeastern spread north and west from that point of uh, time and date. So change the date. Uh, a lot of Australians, are, it's growing, are recognising the need to change that date if we want a national um, holiday. Uh, one minute, a couple of more, another slide. Uh, this is the statue before it was um, graffitied. Uh, and it's, it's a, a much earlier date there for when it was erected. I just, so 1908, the next slide is um, the uh, vitriol directed at an Aboriginal journalist uh, at the time that he was uh, suggesting that these statues need to be, you know, we need to approach and re revise the histories. And he was being, having a, a gentle, gentle approach. His name's Stan Grant and he's very well respected. Uh, and so you can't read the text, but if you could look up Stan Grant, and the huge outrage at his suggestion following this graffiti. Um, it's really showing that the, uh, 
um, mainstream Australia is having difficulty with, with this idea of um, needing to uh, yeah, revise the way that we have these statues and what we might, may well do to them in the future, hopefully. So I've got no more time, but um, thanks very much. For that. <laughs> so thank you to our four panelists, Karen, um, Professor Hantman, Ben, and Julie. I jotted down lots of notes while they were all speaking, lots of ideas flowing through my head, um, and questions, hopefully thought-provoking questions. So Karen spoke to us about an indigenous perspective of monuments as a way to mark places of significance, and she focused on living with the dead and burial mounds for the Monacan people. Um, Professor Hantman focused on the highway marker system as a path to sanctification for native peoples, and how this begins to rectify um, the violence to Native peoples here in Virginia. Ben offered a wonderful Native students perspective here at UVA. Um, unfortunately, Ben is just one of a handful of Native students here at Virginia, and I think this sheds light on a larger problem of erasure here at UVA in general. Um, and thinking about the Conqueror of the Northwest statue and the Lewis and Clark statue. And I would also like to build on that and think about Charlottesville. We have this really ingrained narrative of Thomas Jefferson, being this founding father, building Charlottesville, building UVA on the backs of enslaved laborers. But who was here, here before? Um, the story goes, if you take the historical tour here at UVA, that um, Thomas Jefferson acquired the land from James Madison. <laughs> but what about the indigenous peoples? What about the Monacan people? And that's something that could easily be changed um, to alter this historical narrative that is told. Um, Julie then brought us an international perspective, a very welcome international perspective um, from Australia and Tasmania in particular, as a fellow settler colonial um, nation state. So we are not an isolated institution here at UVA in Charlottesville or in the United States, um, but what is going on globally in terms of memory and monuments um, and statues? So something that I was really thinking about, um, if any of our panelists would like to address this, and this is a question I posed to my students this semester. Um, we began the semester, of course, focusing on the statues, the Confederate statues, and how do these two statues, the Conqueror of, of the Northwest and the Lewis and Clark statue, um, what do they mean for Native peoples um, and for the broader, more broad general public? So what is the meaning of monument, memorial, and statue? Where do you see overlap? and how are these three forms of memory distinguished from one another? That's really complicated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I tell my students, there's never a right or wrong answer and the answers are not easy. <laughs> mm. I think it reflects a, a very different worldview the idea of memorializing a person for a specific series of actions during some important historical event. Um, for instance, picking out Robert E. Lee and not telling us anything about anyone else who fought during the Civil War, when how many thousands or hundreds, I don't even know, of thousands of people died, um, were choosing this one narrative. Um, I was really intrigued by your phrase, his, uh, national amnesia. I've never heard that before. But I was thinking when I've watched mystery shows on TV, amnesia is something that happens when someone gets knocked in the head and then they forget all of the past. And so what can we say about America? There was nothing that really knocked us in the head except a, a real desire to write the story from a, a happy perspective, you know, and, and so often mm -hmm. I've heard these stories in Virginia about how the slaves were really happy and it was really a nice plantation situation. And it was really okay that the Indians vanished because they didn't have all that much to offer. They weren't really that advanced, you know, and so there's a simplification of other people's stories that's happening uh, deliberately and uh, continuously in the way that we tell this narrative. Um, and there are multiple ways of doing it differently. So that'd be my response. You said monuments, memorials, and... Statues. And st oh, statues. I'll answer very briefly in that in any work I've ever done with monuments and memorials, 
as I tried to show in one mark, highway marker, and have tried to do in writing a book, is, uh, is to never leave the history in the past or the legacy of that history in the past. So I don't do statues, uh, no one's asked me, but uh, monuments and memorials, yeah. And those monuments and memorials, the one we're designing, the one at, for instance, at UNC Chapel Hill right now, which is a, mon a, mon a memorial to the enslaved workers there, you know, they just unveiled it and it's controversial because it's in the past. It doesn't bring it, doesn't consider the legacy of slavery to contemporary students at UNC or anyone in North Carolina, black or white or Native American. And I think our responsibility in, is not to add a, a little signage in front of an offensive statue, but to rewrite history in the, in the best way we can, bringing it into the present, or else it's nostalgia. Because the legacy of violence and the legacy of inequality is felt every day. We can do that. You're doing that. You're doing that. And, uh, you know, I try to do that myself. So I don't make it, I, I guess statues are something different. I suppose there's a plaque on, this, on statues. They should also convey complexity, legacy, bring it to the present. <coughs> I think uh, largely all three are um, essentially the same. They're all about uh, trying to remember a certain point in history, uh, a certain idea. Um, and that's really important, especially in public spaces, um, to, to remember um, where your people have come from. Um, the only problem arises when um, the history is misrepresented. Like, as, as we were saying before, uh, with Confederate statues and um, sort of ignoring the history of violence um, and then just sort of washing that all out and saying, look how, great all of, uh, look how great our history was. Look how great we were before. We have done no wrong. Um, that's, that's where um, a, a lot of uh, the issues um, of monuments and memorials really arises. Just uh, thinking of Tasmania and the bronze male statues, there are a few that I didn't talk about, and um, and they've all, and they have done terrible deeds. These particular statues, they all seem to be, yeah, th this uh, idea of replacing and affecting that amnesia, in fact, by replacing former stories on places that are often significant, and so replacing that story and the person that should or would be talked about or the, or the people that should or would have otherwise been spoken about. So in, in the middle of Hobart is a, is a statue of uh, um, a man called William Crowther who, who he, and then two generations later, his grandson sent Tasmanian Aboriginal uh, human remains to museums overseas. So, and, um, so there has been a lot of talk over the years about modifying the statues by night in that particular square because it is like a body snatching kind of public square in Hobart. The, um, I think that when I'm thinking of Aboriginal people represented um, in any kind of monumental form in Australia, um, it, what, what seems to be happening is more and more uh, sport, sporting fig, Aboriginal sporting figures are kind of statues and, mm -hmm. and not much else. And that's kind of interesting to think about why is that so? Mm -hmm. But it's a mixture. It's a community, Aboriginal community themselves um, actually wanting that but it also makes me think about this idea of that ge um, generally w we j would not want to valorize one individual generally so yeah they're just really it's quite odd to think that you would want something there indefinitely in bronze i just don't know who when they put up a statue in 1900 did they really think it was going to be there in you know 2000 you know 100 years 400 years i mean how it's uh, <laughs> it's very strange. So thinking about the intersections of monuments, and memorials, and statues, and the literal cementing of history in place, 
My work looks at, my research looks a lot at erasure narratives. So these stories that are continuously told about place and about people. And here in Virginia, of course, the most prevalent one, I would say, is the Pocahontas story. Um, the Disney version, a very sanitized version, um, and how that contributes to not only the deliberate erasure of Native peoples, um, but how that collides with uh, the term that Julie used in her introduction, which I read. It's not a term that I coined, unfortunately. <laughs> but how, how does that intersect with national amnesia? Um, in my class, my students, you know, we're always thinking about these erasure narratives um, and how for me an erasure narratives is a deliberate act, right? We don't want to acknowledge the real history of violence, of colonialism, to where amnesia, it's like a medical condition, right? Um, something that's not always willingly done, this forgetting of the past. Um, so thinking about an amnesia versus the deliberate erasure of people's history, um, the selective erasure of one history. Um, and for me, this erasure of Native peoples is directly tied to the dispossession of American Indian landscapes, of American Indian land, um, and their erasure on the physical landscape as well, and the lack of monuments, memorials, signage, plaque, highway markers, whatever it may be. Um, and that's inherently tied here in Virginia to the legal erasure of American Indian people on legal <coughs> documents, birth certificates, marriage records, death records. Um, and as Karen mentioned, American Indian people in Virginia, either legally you became white um, or you became black, you became colored. Um, so the American Indians did not exist as a legal category um, for s some time. And now the state is just beginning to reconcile the history of that and trying to identify who Native peoples are and what that has done to the history here in Virginia. Um, and then of course, the Racial Integrity Act um, further complicated the matter. So w there's the erasure on the landscape, but also the legal erasure of Indian people here in Virginia. So I'm thinking about the links between land and dispossession, as well as property. So putting memorials and monuments of Native people in conversation with Confederate monuments. Um, I'm thinking about property, both physical property, the landscape, but human property in terms of slavery. Um, something that's also often overlooked is American Indians and slavery and how these are all intertwined here in Virginia. Do any of you have any comments on the intersections of land and property um, and memory? Professor Hampton? Um, I'm not going to... I want to speak to the um, amnesia issue. Yeah. Which suggests it was once seen and then it was forgotten. And in, in terms of James Madison not being the found, you know, the first person here, one of the most compelling things I found is the record, and we put it in the highway sign. The, the village was occupied into the 18th century. Well, who shows? That's when Peter Jefferson shows up, and the Carr family, and and Ambrose Madison. 18th century. They knew they were. They saw Indian people. Jefferson records a visit of indigenous people to the very mound that he later disturbed in the 1780s. They, they, this wasn't amnesia. It was mm -hmm. cultural blindness. And when anyone, and this used to be the narrative when you entered Monticello, um, they and we talked about Terra Nullius that. These colonial people could look right at a native person and say they don't really live here because they don't fence the land and they're not growing it, growing crops to the maximum productivity. Just a quick thought on on the absence of discussion by the Peter Jeffersons, the Ambrose Madisons, James Madison Sr. and Thomas Jefferson never talking about the Indians who were here, even as place names, Indian fields, Indian lands, mm -hmm. Indian gardens. Indian run, they're everywhere. These, these were not modern, um, you know, suburban neighborhoods that like to so call Arrowhead Lane and you know, <laughs> things like that, Cherokee <laughs> Lane and Monica Lane. They were called Indian Fields and Indian Gardens because they were Indian fields and Indian gardens that these colonialists appropriated. I think that's what you're speaking to. People challenged us, ch people challenged uh, any who raised this point over the years by saying, no, Jefferson never wrote about that. And the answer to that is that 
Jefferson also never wrote about his mother. <laughs> <laughs> One sentence after she died, the day after she died, he wrote an uncle in Scotland. Mother is gone. That's it. And yet, we know he had a mother. <laughs> so don't let the absence of mm -hmm. discussion in the colonial record, look at the maps, look at the names, the place names, it's so clear. Right. So they were amnesic, but they were also uh, decidedly blind right. by their own culture. Selective hearing, selective, selective yeah. sight. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to speak to that too, because I think what we're really talking about begins with the doctrine of discovery and the notion that uh, European nations came up with the idea that only European princes could own land. So any land that they didn't already know about, which they discovered, occupied by non-Christian people, was theirs for the taking or the claiming and the planting of a cross, the claiming of that land. And by calling it virgin territory, the terra nullius idea, they were suggesting um, some very weird and distorted ideas. First, that nobody already lived there. Second, that the land was theirs for distorting in their image. And that there was a sexual element to the conquering of the land that goes hand in hand with the subjugation of, of women, mm -hmm. um, which they were a patriarchal culture as we know. So when we talk about the, the story of Pocahontas, which I say is the first American myth, we're talking about the deliberate sexualization of an 11-year-old child who did not fall in love with John Smith. And as I told our visitors earlier, um, John Smith only recorded that story after everyone else involved had died. And he also claimed to have been um, saved by women in exotic places two other times in his life. So he clearly thought he was very irresistible. But if you look at his picture in real life, I would question that. <laughs> he looked nothing like Colin Farrell. <laughs> and Colin Farrell played him in the New World film, which was all about how John Smith fell in love with Pocahontas, who was represented by a 14-year-old native actress. So while we're talking about you know, people having relationships with 14-year-olds, okay, they never had sex on screen, but they were clearly emotionally involved. Um, and, and so I have to wonder, you know, what is the element of uh, property that's represented by both land and, and female subjugation? And how is it that Native women had a lot more power in cultures here, such that Powhatan's uh, name, his title was Werewants. The title for a female leader was Werewansqua. And that suffix, S-Q-U-A, has been um, obliterated and distorted to mean squaw, which was a, a degrading term for American Indian women. So take American Indian female leader and turn it into female drudge or slave. You're changing the role of women and you're allowing yourself to take control not only of her body, but of her people's territory. That's it. <laughs> I a, a, you raised an interesting point, which is slavery, Indian, mm -hmm. enslavement of Indian people in Virginia. Uh, you know, the English, talk about creating myths. The English like to say the Spanish were cruel and they enslaved or demanded labor from those they colonized in the West and Latin America. And they would never do that. Hmm. Alan Galley in 2004 published a book on enslavement of Indian people in the Carolinas in enormous numbers. We like to say, well, Indians' numbers decreased because of these infectious diseases. We don't like to say it, but there's a, it's easy to refer to infectious diseases for which there's no evidence north of, the, of Florida and Georgia. So it's not been played out yet, but this is one of the biggest research topics right now, is documenting the slave trade of Native people in Virginia and what a large role that played in the depopulation and destruction of aspects of Native society. I, I think, is that what you were? Right, and thinking? then how that kind of clearing of land of, yes. by, of indigenous bodies then That's opened right. the door for the plantation system and chattel slavery. Exactly. 
So before I turn it over to questions, comments from the audience, I want to come back to a comment that Julie made that really kind of captivated me was thinking about revisionist history as in need of revising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, I also know that we have some Dakota guests in the audience today from South Dakota. Um, so I'm from Minnesota, so I want to give you a warm, literally a warm Charlottesville welcome. <laughs> um, so if any of you have any comments, um, I'll be taking them and I'll repeat them in the microphone so that we have audio of it as well. So a question from the audience member, um, how to commemorate and remember those individuals who are kind of lost in the mist, particularly um, American Indian people who were slaves throughout the 18th and century. Whole groups, whole and whole groups, groups yeah, definitely groups of native peoples, particularly in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia area. How do we remember those people? I, I, I think um, the research is begging to be done. I've tried to do some of it. It's going back through colonial records and recognizing that when an entire community living on the, of indigenous people living on the Eastern Shore is found guilty of the murder of an Englishman, and for that they are collective, collectively found guilty and sent to the West Indies with a one-way ticket. But the word enslavement is never there. We need to reread that, that, that occurs so frequently. Um, it's, it's scary. So one is revisiting that history and, and understanding how it was whitewashed in those days. And reiterating the point from before, I would, it relates to contemporary issues of uh, recognition by the state and the federal government. What, and, you know, it, the, the trope, the word that Native people in Virginia hear is, that we all hear is disappeared. Mm -hmm. This mystical, how, does, how do you disappear? But if you go through the records and see, oh, well, 32 adult men were found guilty for the murder of one man and sent to the West Indies never to return, it's not disappearance. And so just that helps as revisiting the texts of the eugenics era and census records of the eugenics era, we have to start revisiting those texts starting in the 1600s, 1500s, and, and that brings it to today, which I think is very important. Changes the history from a disappearing people, which is an impossible act, to a people who were against whom violence and enslavement was a fact. Yeah, I'm right. just thinking in an Australian context, there's um, two things happening now that are um, kind of affecting that, which are um, there's a new exhibition this week, permanent exhibition, so it's finding the real estate, the place to um, share those histories permanently, and um, Melbourne Museum has opened a gallery dedicated to massacres in Victoria, the state of Victoria in Australia, curated by Genevieve Greaves, who's a um, Aboriginal uh, writer, curator, artist, um, and uh, and she has um, undertaken a lot of interviews on country. We say like on country around Victoria, uh, with descendants and also descendants of uh, people who were whose ancestors were participating in the in the murders. So that's a big deal. That and that um, is well overdue, but happening. And then the other is um, online presence to get stories out. So. Lyndall Ryan, a historian, a professor in Australia, is creating an um, atlas of uh, massacres. So it doesn't necessarily have to be massacres, but how to make the space and get the stories out, um, just uh, kind of be fierce in making, finding that space online and, and probably in mu museum type environments, I think. So this question um, puts the monuments, the statues in conversation with the history of colonization, um, dispossession, and how do we begin a process of recognition and repatriation and redistribution for American Indians and African Americans? <laughs> um, I feel like uh, it just needs to be done a step at a time. 
Um, there isn't necessarily one right way to go about it. It's just educating people about true history. And once people realize um, w what has been done in the past by, by their ancestors and to their ancestors um, and you know, to people today, uh, we can only hope that um, they will have, that people today or in the future will have the, the conscience to do the right thing with the, the new, their newly acquired information. So we have a comment about the school system, I assume the K through 12 students, and how we can begin to remedy um, a lot of these issues. Um, ben mentioned taking it one step at a time, but reaching out to the youth. And I think that's very important. Um, over the three semesters that I've taught here at UVA, every single class, the majority of students are just astounded by this lack of history that they're told. And the vast majority of my students are from here in Virginia. And for many students, that history ends with Pocahontas. And they get a very sanitized version of it. Julie? Yeah, in, in um, Tasmania, we have elders in residence, Aboriginal elders in residence in the university sy <coughs> system, uh, respected elders and we ha from different family groups. But in the um, primary and high school system, we have a similar um, program with elders <coughs> who visit different Aboriginal elders visiting schools and um, also uh, younger people uh, who have different skill sets working. So that's paid, funded by the state education system for Indigenous people to actively uh, visit and undertake programs in schools. This is, um, I don't know if this is about a decade old, I'm not sure how long it's been going, but it's, that is affecting real change. Yes, sir. <coughs> Being a teacher for 100 years, I, I did teach first grade for like 22 years, and if I think back of how many Pocahontas I mimeographed, you know, to color, uh, you know, I'm a little embarrassed, but like anything else, you change as you grow. And what we have now is I see teachers today, they're not mimeographed, but they're copying the Pocahontas pictures to color, but you know, we are getting change, like any big system, through mindfulness programs and, and things like that. And it is true. I mean, we have to talk to the children. We'll start with the children. So. Um, coming from Minnesota, where there is a much more visible American Indian population, it's very similar problems there as well um, here in Virginia. But I do think the lack of state rec or federally recognized tribes here in Virginia also plays a role um, in the creation of Indian education programs within school districts. Karen, did you want to speak as well? I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I, I was the chair of the Virginia Council on Indians before it disbanded, and one of the things we managed to get done was we uh, went to Governor Warner and had him mandate that the next time the social studies standards of learning were changed, Virginia Indians would sit on that committee. And we did. And what we found was that at every grade level, all of the, well, the very few standards that apply to American Indians were written in the past tense. Mm -hmm. So it was, this is where Indians lived, this is what kind of house they lived in, this is the kind of food they ate, and kids are getting the impression, obviously, they no longer exist. Mm -hmm. So we changed all of that language to reflect the continuous presence of 18,000 years ago till today. And what happens when you change the standards of learning, because it affects all of the tests, that the children take is then they have to rewrite the textbooks. So when they rewrote them, we reviewed them and made sure that not only was the text appropriate, but the images were appropriate. So we weren't showing pictures of uh, Dakota Indians uh, in Virginia and so on. Um, you know, and some of the really egregious things that have happened in the past. Um, so I, I kind of wish I could be 10 years old now and go back and learn that story because mm -hmm. this is nothing like what I got. And it's still not complete. I mean, we weren't able to change the standard that said Columbus discovered America. You know, but we're trying. And I think that it's made a significant change so that at least maybe the next generation will be somewhat more informed than ours and subsequent. Professor Hantman? There's a, a PS. Uh, I, I, I don't know of a more conservative uh, industry in America than textbook <laughs> writers. It's you know, they just have to reach the broadest audience. And this story we're telling here is one that, you know, gets resistance. And so to go before a state school board of education and mm -hmm. from fourth grade on, it has to be approved statewide. It's a very <coughs> tough. 
but it can be done. I work with several publishers in Core Knowledge, which writes curriculum, and, and it's slow but steady. I, so the textbook, you have to work with the textbook industry and also work with them on teaching evolution also while you're at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. But um, Karen has run summer institutes in the past for teachers because Jack is the greatest teacher in the world. We'll celebrate Jack McMillan here. He's not in the, included in what I'm about to say. But there's a lot of resistance from the teachers also because this isn't what the curriculum said last year. And sometimes you can put the best textbook and the best curriculum in the world down there, and it, we lose it on the, level, on, the, on the ground. It just doesn't get communicated or it's skipped over. This, so I, this, these summer institutes that so the state funded, Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, if we can get teachers in, they get so excited in your programs to teach this new perspective. I'd like, that's, that's my advice. That's my answer to your question. We don't have funding for those right now. And the funding's yeah. been cut, yeah. So we have a question from an art historian who want, is thinking about the disconnect between the physicality of structure, whether it be granite, marble, bronze, and how that is a disconnect from indigenous uh, memorializations. I'm going to say it goes back to a Western worldview's fear of disappearing and death. Because if you look at it, you know, um, Native people never put the ancestors in a casket with the idea that they wouldn't go back and be part of the earth, you know. And a lot of the most sacred objects to Native people are meant to deteriorate over time to go back and become part of the cycle of life. And I'm thinking especially of the Zuni war gods, which were, uh, many of them were collected by art collectors and held in institutions around the world, when their function was to remain in place and guard the people who lived there. And they were supposed to go back and rot over time. But the museum community is so not about that. You know, we need to put arsenic on things mm -hmm. so that they don't, deteriorate and no insects can get to them. Well, you can't wear a mask on your face if it has arsenic on it, you know? So, so there are major issues between those competing agendas. And, and if we think about, you know, collecting uh, human remains and putting them in a mound, it's with the idea that we want to be part of the earth. We want to mm -hmm. stay here in that way. And, and that's a different kind of thing than, uh, I, I read somewhere that the, what was it, the, um, the Anglican Church.